Hi Fools, I'm Joel South. And I'm Taylor Muckerman, and this is Digging for Value. Today we're going to be talking about uh, why Syria in a vacuum doesn't really matter for oil prices. We're also going to talk about some of the best and worst performing energy stocks so far in 2013. Right off the bat though, we want to get into some headlines and coming up on our agenda is the debt ceiling is about to be uh, on, our, on our topic of conversation mm -hmm. here. Um, and Joel, you see that as having implications in the energy space. Yeah, definitely. This has been an issue throughout 2013. And once again, we're looking somewhere right after Labor Day of uh, us again approaching the $16.7 trillion dollar, uh, spending limit. Obviously, this is a big issue uh, because really on both sides, there's still a lot of bickering. The Republicans want to see some concessions. They want to see some spending cuts. Mm -hmm. So if we do get into this period and nothing actually is put together or the, the, um, the limit is extended, you know, you'll see a lot of interest rates really start spiking, then you also see a lot of bonds and stocks. Really the equity market will be in extreme volatility, mm -hmm. so this obviously has a big impact, especially in the energy and material space. Now honing in on rising interest rates and volatility, where do, which sectors of the, energies, of the energy industry are you really going to hone in on, or maybe even some specific companies that you think could be affected positively or negatively? Yeah, definitely. When I like to look at dividends in this space, and obviously if you see rising interest rates, dividends aren't that attractive. However, you'll also see a lot of volatility, which puts people back into the dividend play because they want to make sure they're getting some income while they hold their stocks over the long term. So, you know, what I'm looking here is companies that have proven balance sheets that can go through a lot of environments that have great businesses that you can win in the long term. And really when you look at that space, you have to look at the MLP space because they have some of the best dividends or distributions in right, that case in this industry. So you know, I'm looking for uh, firms that have lower cost of capital that can ex still extend their businesses and access that capital even with higher interest rates co going forward. And then you also want to see companies that have long term contracts over the long term. Um, so, with that said, Enterprise Product Partners, one company I really like, they've shown through numerous interest rate cycles that they've outperformed the market. They're also eight years plus of co consistently updating their or improving their distribution, which is very solid. And they also have a knack of pushing out that maturity without raising cost of capital, which in this industry is extremely important. Another company I like is Boardwalk, uh, Boardwalk Pipeline Partners. The reason I like them, they have great, uh, they have great financials and they also have a general partner in Lowe's that can go right. in and help them out. And if you look at their long-term fixed fee contract, basically about 80% of their business is fixed and long-term, so you can count on that distribution to be there and continually growing while you can get that income while the markets are still in flux. So this is a safe play. And then last, I kind of like uh, C-Drill. This is a company that has a dividend of over 8%. And you're seeing the offshore market really pick up right now. We're put our, past our post macondo levels, and you're seeing in the long-term that this is a sector that really is needed and a lot of growth. So you can see that dividend continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. You'll see that cash flows from that company, from Cedril, going back to the shareholders. So that's a company I really like. Those are three solid dividend companies that I could see performing for the long term if you see a very volatile market right, coming forward. Rates, yeah. yeah, definitely. So uh, going back to another bit really busy headline, the potash industry has really been up in the air after you saw the uh, Russian and Belarus um, pretty much potash cartel kind of yeah, exactly. in flux. So why don't you really tell us more about what's going on? Yeah, really over the last month, it's been a, in the news uh, kind of s swinging in and out. So you've seen originally the cartel, or they call it a marketing agreement between Euro Kali and Belarus Kali, uh, two of the largest potash uh, producers in the world. Together, they controlled about 40% of global exports. And they decided to separate ways, maybe not on the best of terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, you've seen uh, the CEO of Euro Kali being invited to Belarus only to have him arrested there. So it kind of caught him off guard a little bit. And so Russia isn't too happy about that, as Yoklai is a pretty important company within that nation. Yeah, definitely. You, you, like you mentioned, the arrest is obviously big news, but there's more going on in this area. So what's the new, newest emerging news out of this whole spat? Yeah, well, now you're seeing Russia kind of playing maybe a little childish games here. They're threatening to withhold up to a quarter of the oil that they transport from Russia to Minsk in Belarus. So they're also going to claim that Belarus's dairy exports aren't quite up to snuff in Russian standards. So maybe a little cat and mouse game here um, now that the CEO is still being detained in Belarus. Um, so I'm going to continue to watch this and see its implications on maybe um, how this deal might be renegotiated. So when you're talking about that and also a lot of the Canadian potash mm -hmm. producers, you know, what does this mean for investors and what should they be watching? Well, certainly it has tremendous implications on the likes of the members of Campotex, which is a similar image of what um, 
uh, the Belarus Potash Company really was as a cartel in Canada. Mm -hmm. You have Potash Corp of Saskatchewan, Agrium, and Mosaic all taking part in this. Um, Potash Corp of Saskatchewan receiving the bulk of the revenues from this marketing deal. Um, and they've really taken a hit since this first deal was announced in late July of the separation. So I'm going to continue to watch this. And what I'm really focusing on is maybe this is just an acceleration of lowering prices of potash because it does really have a lot of uh, use, to, use to storage ratios mm -hmm. when you compare it to um, different uh, like nitrogen and phosphate as a fertilizer. They really have um, high reserves at, at all these producers. So maybe this is just a time where China and India will take advantage of lower prices, bulk up their stockpiles, reduce the stockpiles at the producers, and maybe that'll lead to a long-term price gain um, in, the, mm -hmm. in the potash segment. And maybe five to 10 years down the road, uh, these producers will look back and, and really thank Belarus and, and Russia for kind of uh, separating ways. And now we're gonna kind of talk about um, another uh, good cop, bad cop kind of thing here. Mm -hmm. um, first quarter, second quarter, uh, we're, you're going to highlight a few of the companies in the energy sector that did really well. Yeah, definitely. Well, the energy sector so far in the, uh, in the second quarter overall did not perform that well. It's one sure of the worst besides material sectors in the S&P. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there's one subsector that has been doing pretty strong over the last year and, and even into this year, and that's really the offshore drilling market. And if you look at the jackup market, it's been, I think, the biggest surprise in this space. You've seen the, the interest or the day rates and the utilization rates really pop up. Yeah. You can look at a company like Hercules Offshore, who's up 70% in the last year, and they've been really surprised because they have a great market share in the Gulf of Mexico, in the, the shallow uh, Gulf of Mexico, and they're really expanding into the Middle East, which has been the real driver for that market. So you're seeing really good things there. Then also in the ultra deep market, you're seeing so much new capacity that's coming online because the demand has been huge there and you're seeing really uh, if you can look at C drill as a company that recently had earnings you know you saw a lot of earnings from the ultra market or ultra deep market really boosting them mm -hmm. they've also went out and increased their dividend and utilization rates for them and a lot of their other players have been huge the only holdback in the near term has been that just the deep market uh, the reason that is is some of the ships in that area are a little older, so you're seeing some companies like uh, TransOcean, you're also seeing Ensco and Noble Corp kind of getting hit for short-term uh, holdbacks in the deep water market, but if you look long-term, that's really just a quick hiccup. I wouldn't worry about that. That could be a time to jump in and buy. The companies look very great over the long term. You're know, looking at a lot of research institutes really saying that uh, close to $100 billion is going to be needed mm -hmm. to be spent on rigs over the next few years. So yep. that obviously bodes well. And now that Mexico might be opening up its um, its waters to some uh, international companies Absolutely. also bodes well. So over the long term, how do you think about these companies? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you just mentioned that the amount of money that's going in there and you're seeing big oil going out and spending a lot of money and yep. doing a lot of exploration. And they're putting that money over the long term. So you're not going to see a whole lot of cycles here. They're spending the money. They know they're going to go out and use these rigs. So the demand will be there. And you can even look at, like you mentioned, Wood McKenzie came out and basically said, in the deep water market, you're basically looking at uh, $43 billion in 2012. By 2022, they're looking at $114 billion in spending. So obviously, they're looking at huge growth. There's about a 9% compounded annual growth rate for the next decade yeah. um, in the offshore market. So obviously, for these companies, especially a company like Sea Drill and TransOcean, who have such large and newer or getting newer uh, offshore ships, this is very solid for them. And you're also looking at another 95 uh, floaters that are going to be needed in over the next few years. And if you compare that to right now, there's only about 112 out there. So you're basically, this sector is going to double and you're looking at a few small players or a, few, a number of small players, but under five or six that are really commanding that market. Sure. So being one of the new guys in there, you can really count on getting that cash flows for the long term and you can either count on that stable or growing distribution or dividend depending on what company you're looking at. So overall, I think this is a great sector. And conversely, you're looking at three yeah, companies that uh, have not been doing that well in 2013. So tell us what's going on there. Yeah, over the first half, there was a mix. I looked at stock performance over the first half and three energy materials companies fell in the bottom 10. And I'm looking at U.S. Steel, obviously with the global growth slowdown, mm -hmm. construction and, and industrial spending hasn't quite been there. So steel demand has slackened and U.S. Steel fell in the bottom 10. And then you're looking at First Solar, also struggling with uh, trying to produce a backlog, trying to regenerate that. And the international demand has really slowed for them as they've kind of concentrated around the equator. And they really have produced a lot of utility scale uh, solar installations, 
but it's kind of dried up, so they're going to have to work on how they can figure out to attack the new market uh, mechanisms that you've been seeing. And then Alpha Natural Resources, worst performer of the S&P 500, mm -hmm. third largest met metallurgical coal producer, follows right along with U.S. Steel because metallurgical coal is a key component into the generation of steel. So all three of those companies, unfortunately for their investors, really uh, had a bad first six months of the year. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because all three of those companies have been really the bellwethers in the space. Sure. They were the guys that really went out there and kind of made themselves one of the first movers. You know, you can look at U.S. Steel in that market. Mm -hmm. um, and then also uh, First Solar is a company that really was one of the main players to really kick off the solar boom. So, you know, that said, do you think that these companies have a chance over the long term? Uh, yes and no. I mean, you kind of had depends on your time frame. You look at uh, U.S. Steel, ArcelorMittal. Really, they, they raised their expectations for Chinese demand for steel, but that only counteracted their expectations for slightly declined demand from the European Union and North America to finish out the year. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at like three percent growth year over year. Um, and, and while that's not that great, I think you can maybe look outside of U.S. Steel, maybe like a Nucor, who is the lowest cost producer in the United States. States, the largest steel producer here, and once they get that direct reduced iron facility going that's uh, fueled by natural gas rather than coal down in Louisiana, it's even going to add to their to their advantage, as a lot of steel producers have kind of caught up on the cost curve, so they're going to uh, really take advantage of that, I think, as it comes online at the end of this year, mm -hmm. and then moving into 2014 when it can really ramp up its operations. You look at First Solar, a lot of new competition here with solar leasing on the residential side, mm -hmm. with Sun Power and Solar City getting into that heavily. Both of those stocks doing really well and First Solar really not. So I'm looking at if they can kind of counteract the slowdown in the utility size um, solar installations and really try and attack a different market segment in the solar industry. And then with Alpha Natural Resources, a little bit more bearish on this company than the other two. Uh, Joy Global announced it's lowering expectations for 2014. Two thirds of their business comes from coal miners. So obviously they have an ear to the ground mm -hmm. and they don't believe very strongly in the next uh, 18 months. And Caterpillar already announced their reduced guidance for 2013. So that's the next 18 months. The two biggest mining equipment companies in the world are feeling pretty pretty down on the prog on the prognosis on of what news. to expect. So unfortunately, I don't like what's happening here with Alpha Natural Resources. So hopefully they can maybe attack the export market with thermal coal, but right now, stay away. Hmm, that's very and interesting. Now moving on to our last segment, we're gonna look at some current events, and you're really gonna turn into the MLP space, which you think is really maybe being turned on its head right now, for good or for bad, what's your thoughts? Yeah, definitely, the MLP space has really helped the infrastructure for the oil sector really take off over the last 20 years. And basically, the good thing about being in an MLP or Master Limited Partnership is you basically skip the double taxation. So you're basically moving all of the cash giving it to the unit holders and just being taxed at that rate as a business owner, which is good for the companies. So, to be, so by being able to lower uh, or pass that on to unit holders, the companies are able to lower their cost of capital and in heavy uh, capital intensive industries, this is very important to grow your business. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously that's very good and finding new ways to grow or finding new ways to go out and access capital is huge. And one new uh, or one um, uh, law right now that's that's in Congress is the MLP Parity Act. Basically, what they're they're trying to do is allow the same tax breaks that the oil and gas and um, and, and uh, REIT sector mm -hmm. are getting and basically offering that to renewable companies, sure. renewable energy companies, huge, and this would be huge, very huge for them because that will allow them to go out into the market and access capital instead of going and having to get venture funds to really grow your business. And you can look at companies like Solar City that, luckily, you know, they had Elon Musk and a lot of money behind that to really get it off the ground. But other than that. They, these uh, companies are kind of locked in. They either all have to go into the equity markets right away, which is not a, a really viable option if you're not to that mass quantity or that if you have the, um, the, the plan and the, the markets to really ta attack. So this is really a nice way that will allow these companies to lower the cost of capital and be competitive like you've seen in the, mm -hmm. the pipeline industry, which is very solid. Yeah, solar companies obviously clamoring to have that pass. And a lot of people might not realize Elon Musk is the brain mastermind behind Solar City, mm -hmm. not the CEO, but he's on the board and uh, kind of lent that idea to a friend. Mm -hmm. And what can't this guy do right these, these days? Absolutely. And so now keeping with MLP space, what are other developments that you're seeing that maybe some innovation that companies are really starting to come up with? Yeah, definitely. We just, recently we saw Vanguard National Resources and basically our natural resource. And what they did was really interesting. They went and issued a lot of non-convertible uh, perpetual um, preferred 
uh, div or preferred equities. And basically what that does is they're going out and not only accessing the individual investor like the MLPs right. were before, and they're also getting into a lot of institutional firms that before they couldn't really um, go and invest in into MLPs. They would have to go through some other type of trust. So this is very nice for them. And so by accessing both of that, they're really going out and getting new, um, accessing new capital. And um, what's really nice about this, this form is by uh, by releasing these equities, you're not growing the businesses by going out and diluting the common units. Uh, so you're you're uh, reaching this different area and not hurting the actual unit holders that are in place. So you're really growing your business without basically diluting the shares, which has been one of the big areas in this space. As companies try to grow, they go out to get the capital. The, the unit holders would be hurt because obviously they're yeah. being diluted out. So that's very, like that. very solid. Um, so when you look at that, uh, this is really a good way for companies, a smart way for companies to go out, grab new capital, really grow their, their companies by getting at, turning in, dropping down assets, growing their distributions, and then returning to unit holders. So I think it's really a win-win for the common unit holders. And it's also a great way for the companies to access new capital. And it gives in, institutional investors in and able to go and get high um, dividend distribution sure. yields in their books as well. So that's also something that I really like. Uh, another big topic that's been up in the air, or been- Maybe the biggest, yeah. Yeah, the biggest in the, in the market, yeah. and it basically has affected the market all week, has been Syria. So what do you see going on with Syria, and how do you relate that to the oil and gas markets? Well, if you take a look at Syria on its own, it really can't affect oil markets as broadly as the market has reacted. I think that the market has priced in the likelihood of contagion spreading. You saw prices of oil per barrel at 106 and a half on Monday, spiking up to over 110, right around $109 mm -hmm. a barrel right now. So some significant movements here uh, haven't really flowed down to the consumer yet, but if it's prolonged, it definitely could. And I don't think that if it just strictly sticks with Syria, if, if the US and the UK and France don't decide to attack, and it just stays within its borders, I don't think that this price spike will last um, because Syria isn't really so meaningful on the global stage. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it has boosted the price of oil and also, you know, caused the general markets overall to um, re re uh, go in recession a little bit right. uh, over for the last few days. However, why don't you see Syria really mattering over the over the next few weeks or so? Well, if you look at the overall oil market, it really is just a drop in a barrel, if you could allow me to say that as a kind of a pun there. You look at multiple countries in the Middle East alone can make up for production just at the snap of a finger. Mm -hmm. uh, Saudi Arabia already announced they're trying to increase uh, the third quarter production by a million barrels a day over the second quarter. Right there, that's Syria. I mean, who cares? They could not produce another barrel of oil for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia's got them covered. So, And that's just one country. You still have Iran that could boost production. Iraq. I mean, the whole area really has it under control if we're looking at a global uh, possible shortage of oil. Yeah, like you mentioned, um, the amount of oil they're producing is not really there, but mm -hmm. there could be some other ramifications in other areas. Sure. Uh, so if you take the total region, uh, what do you see as the outlook and the implications from this? Yeah, despite North American's energy boom right now, the Middle East is still the most important oil producing region. You look at 2012, a third of all exported oil came from here. Despite European and uh, North American sanctions on Iran, they're still a top 10 exporter. And Russia was the number one producer of oil in 2012, closely followed by Saudi Arabia. So you look at Iran and Russia, both siding with uh, with Syria. So if anything does happen there as far as an attack or, or possibly um, some military action there, mm -hmm. you could see Iran and Syria maybe pull some strings and kind of disrupt the markets a little bit more than they have been already this week. So I'm keeping my eye on that. And then Egypt, the deadly protests that continue to go on there, and Libya already having protests, not deadly, but they are protesting against oil production. They're down to an eighth of their overall production right now. After they had shot up since the Gaddafi regime was ended in 2011. So I'm looking at Egypt with their control over the Suez Canal and the Sumed pipeline. The really major hubs and transportation avenues for oil and mm -hmm. natural gas. I think 7% of all uh, transporta transported oil uh, on the water and 13% of liquefied natural gas went through the Suez Canal last mm -hmm. year. So if anything does carry over into that, um, watch out. I don't think that it will, but I think that's why markets have been spiking this week because Syria was just a tip of, uh, just, uh, you know, another, uh, maybe a straw that broke the camel's mm -hmm. back. I hate to use that line, but that could have been what it is because now you see U.S. involvement as a mm -hmm. potential thing. So um, Syria in a vacuum, who cares? If it does spread, watch out. Yeah, definitely watch the implications. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your insight, and be sure to tune back in to fool.com.